beginning, some very general questions. Sure. The first one is, as a child, what was your dream job? My dream job when I was a child? Huh, good question. I have to go back a long time. Um, I think I wanted to become the person who installs the electricity lines over the, um, the train tracks. I was in the period that steam was disappearing and electricity was coming in. And I remember going to the station in one place with my father and look at the steam machines and I was very excited and then discovered the electricity and said, I want to become the guy, the engineer who does the electricity for the, for the new system. When did it first occur to you to become a scientist then? Uh, while um, engaging in medical studies, I had no idea what to do with my life when I, um, when I came out of secondary school. And um, I think I hesitated a long time between a professional musician and something else. But I didn't know what to do something else. So I said, well, let's just wait with the decision. I study medicine and then you can do what anything when you want. And I think that was a wise decision. Anyway, I got back to music anyway, so music is still part of my life. But um, then during my studies uh, came a moment that I thought, mm, maybe taking care of patients is not my whole life. And then a string of um, things happened to me that finally brought me into science. Very interesting. I come back to music later. Um, what was your conception of, a pro of the profession li like? Or back then, of the profession scientists, when you, your conception of the job of... Before discovering mm -hmm. it, uh, I had a vague conception mm -hmm. of what it was, and it probably um, was quite uh, archetypal in the sense of uh, looking at a picture of Albert Einstein and, uh, and having vague ideas of, of, of absent-minded people like the professor in uh, Tintin or um, of Hergé, of course. Uh, and then eventually it started to change because being a student, of course, I was confronted with science more and more, even as a medical student, although it's a very profession-oriented uh, uh, study. Uh, you were well aware that it is always uh, on the frontier mm -hmm. of science and you're continuously confronted to science. And so slowly, slowly, a more um, accurate and realistic uh, image of what science and scientists are about uh, developed. How is the major difference, the picture from those days, the picture we have from science today? Well, the major difference is perhaps the realization that scientists are human beings, ev everybody else, which implies that it comes with all the beauty and the horror of what the human being is and can do. Um, did you have ideals, role models, when you have been young before you decided for this career? Sure, to start off with my father, like any boy. <laughs> um, then later on, of course, I killed my father, as any boy in a, in a classical uh, psychoanalytic uh, fashion uh, is supposed to do. Um, uh, and, and then, um, yes, there were a few directors with whom I worked. And one specifically, um, Peter Macklem, a very famous respirologist from Montreal, where I spent two years as a, as a postdoc, made a tremendous impression on me. And is still today, he died uh, um, a little over a year ago is still uh, one of my main role models that I try to um, to pursue in, in looking for perfection in myself. So he's still one of your ideals, so do you have other, let's say, persons, mentors in your life? I've had other mentors in my yeah. life, but who have, whom have not had the same impact as Peter Macklem. Um, I've had professors with whom I worked and for whom I worked who were very strong in their field, but not necessarily with the same breadth and humanity mm -hmm. as Peter Macklin. Peter Macklin was not only an exceptional clinician and scientist, but also an exceptional human, humanistic being. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, the, the word humanistic being, how would you des could you describe this for us in very brief? Um, maybe very it's physical. better in his case to give a few examples. He took extremely well care of his students, his PhD students, his doctoral students, his postdocs, uh, everybody with whom he worked. He took great care in uh, always taking into account 
the human being on the other side of the equation. I've been confronted also to situations in science and elsewhere where sometimes it's, it's just the professional definition of the relationship that counts. And if the professional relationship and also the needs for the institution ask for a sacrifice, it's no problem, you just kill the other. He would never do that. He would always keep in mind the fact that the other person is a human being with all the positive and also, of course, less positive aspects to it. He took great care of his students. In that regard, he still is a good example, an example that I try to, uh, to, uh, to attain when taking care of my students. What you have to look at, if you look at the data, if you look at, I mean, if you have results, parameters, you have to have a, a concept or scientific concept how to interpret the data, especially if you look at brain results? Uh, my answer to that question or observation is the following. There is different types of scientists and different types of scientific en endeavor and approach. And I'm, I'm a bit of a person who sometimes thinks that he was born like 100 or 150 years too late. I would have loved to be a scientist 100 or 150 years ago, <coughs> to, to, to be among the elite that was able to do science in, in those days, because you could be very broad. I'm a very curious person. I'm a typically a scientist, scientist who works from curiosity, who works from observing the world and say, hey, but how does that work? And what's happening here? And then follows his curiosity and tries to find ways to get answers to the questions. I'm not a scientist who is very much focused on one very tiny mm -hmm. little area. They are also important. And they, More and, the Leibniz way of thinking. Yeah, I'm, 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 it, the danger, of course, is that you, 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 you get um, a totally diffuse and, and interest in too many things and you know very little about many things, but mm. not enough. And the, the, the best, of course, in my point of view, is somewhere in the middle. You, you try to maintain focus on a, a few key areas, uh, but still uh, be driven by your curiosity. But essentially, in my case, it's curiosity. And um, uh, and of course, and then you follow up o upon on uh, on what you, what you find. Um, don't, don't forget that science is about finding answers to questions, but the, the the reality is also that by trying to find the answers, you you formulate uh, always new questions and sometimes more than you answer. Mm -hmm. The Socrates thing. I know that I don't know anything comes yeah, yeah. The more you know, the less yeah, the you know. The less you know, yeah, exactly. Um, this refers, I mean, the, what, what I liked when you were sending me your, your, the email with your paper, you said musings about, and this, you know, about doping. And yeah. this, it, it's, it's, uh, and I think science sometimes is uh, not welcoming uh, musings, or they would call it speculations. So I think it's a very important part to have this kind of ability to do so because it's the creative part of science. I fully agree. It can't do without mm. speculation. Th think about formulating new hypotheses. It's pure speculation. It's based on what's known today. Standing on the giants, you're trying to look a bit further, push the horizon, but you are not sure whether it's actually the right direction in which you are looking. Maybe the answer is not there. You'll just have to test the hypothesis. So yes, I mean, speculation is very important. Mm -hmm. It's maybe interesting to recall those who are not familiar with the field how communication of science today happens. It's mainly papers, research papers, and, and they're organized in a very special way, uh, very dissimilar to how we organize writing in general in society. And it makes a very clear distinction between the facts and the interpretation where there is speculation. The, the results of a study in principle are just black and white facts. It's the thing that was shown, measured, uh, and with a clear indication of the certainty or the uncertainty that comes with those measurements. That's it. You can, and that's, that's what the paper is about. And then of course comes the discussion of those results and then the authors are allowed and, and actually invited to give meaning to those facts. And, and then comes and kicks in the speculation. And 
invariably at the end it's like but we need more research because we are not sure about this or mm -hmm. sure about that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean this is what I or oh, that the public or the people are not aware of this at all it's always like facts and it's forgotten that the word fact is factum and it's made and it's made by men. So uh, physicians in particular but scientists in general too are experts in dealing with uncertainty mm -hmm. and that the general population is not very well aware of. I mean in medicine it's it's clearly very important. Mm -hmm. We learn to deal with uncertainty. You never know really for sure and, and always some open questions that remain. And of course the patient wants to know well yes or no, am I dying or not dying? Will I, will I get better or not better? And sometimes I don't know. Mm -hmm. It, because it's impossible to know. Sometimes you have to pretend. And sometimes you have to pretend, exactly. Mm -hmm.